Uh, my name is Yuri Cummings uh, from the Connectivity Group at uh, Intel, uh, part of DCG, our Data Center Group. Uh, and my talk today is going to be on new workloads and the evolving network. Or really, it's on the network, which is evolving from new workloads. So an interesting factoid, and I'm sure you've heard this factoid in many different ways, but uh, it's predicted um, by smart networking people that by 2021, 95% of all data center traffic will be based in the cloud, and only 5% will be based in the enterprise. No, nothing against any enterprise people. And I'm not saying that there's less data in the enterprise. It's just incredible how much data growth there is in the cloud. Another way, another factoid that says the same thing is that if you look at all the data today, 90% of that was generated in the last two years. So we have a real problem. This actually isn't a rosy picture. This is a, a sort of data gravity which is growing faster uh, than TCO is improving the computing in infrastructure while holding all the architectures constant. And so in the networking space, we're going through a lot of changes. And I wanted to talk about that today in this talk and sort of illustrate some of those inflection points and then leave with you with some of the, some of the things that we're doing to help, the, to help the industry in this area. So the, the three main uh, inflections that we're tracking, one is uh, critical workloads are redefining the network. And we'll, we'll go into all three of these in the, in the charts uh, coming. Secondly, uh, cloud scale, the big get bigger. Actually, this point is kind of uh, true, true by observation, so I don't have any other charts on it. But what it's really saying is that when, you, when you, you look at where the data is today, you have to put more data in that same area, right? You have to do something to solve the energy problem of moving data around. Um, and that plus all just the uh, momentum is really what's driving clouds to, to scale faster than the rest of the industry. The other uh, inflection is pervasive offloads and really creating a distributed intelligence around the, around the data center. Because it turns out, all this data doesn't fit on a single node. So we actually have to figure out a good way to move it back and forth and figure out how to sift through it and, and derive you know, intelligent results from it. So um, this first point, the uh, uh, new workloads, um, and you know, it's artificial intelligence and um, deep learning and AR, VR, et cetera. Uh, there's an aspect of it with driving. And then it's, of course, all the um, storage workloads uh, or database workloads that go along with you know, enabling uh, these sort of foundational new workloads. But it's really not the workloads. I'm not going to explain how deep learning works. I'm not sure I know how it works myself. I wanted to talk about how it's, what its impact on the network is. Um, traditional networks, you know, sort of think of them as like a, a, an acyclic uh, uh, or, um, graph, a non-cyclic non graph, excuse me. Um, and if you look at a picture of sort of a, a service provider network, it almost looks like a fractal pattern, right? And the, the challenge of building those networks is coming up with the right protocols and figuring out the right cost economics to sort of get a bit from anywhere to anywhere else. The end station actually really isn't that important in, the net, in those networks. I mean, you could argue it's becoming more important, but it's really about the communication. But with uh, data centers where you know, we bring all this data together, uh, there's a different type of network that's been evolving in the last 10 plus years, and that really is a scale out fabric. And so the architectures in the data center um, are really designed to uh, be able to handle a lot of cross-sectional bandwidth and a lot of east-west traffic. And if you look at um, the tasks, what we optimize for is really not the network, but the compute. We're trying to get as much efficiency out of the compute as we can. And so we want as little communication time between the tasks. And in particular, we want very little jitter. Because when we have a lot of variability in communication time, it's very hard to schedule our compute. And it's very hard to get optimal efficiency out of it. So that's the sort of the network we see today. And there's a lot of new innovations which are really helping to drive this. But it gets even worse. Um, as we look into uh, really deep levels of acceleration and sifting through a lot of data with routine uh, algorithms, 
uh, we can't just sort of randomly place the data in the data center. We actually have to localize it. And we're seeing the emergence of, of fat nodes, or nodes that have connectivity in them. Um, and so we, we, sometimes we call that the inner loop, is sort of a, a, a coding joke. But um, in w what those networks are really designed for is scheduling the uh, memory uh, uh, into the local um, uh, accelerators, normally like a multiply accumulate unit, to keep them full and to really keep the efficiency of, of, um, of that going at, at high speed. And then we also see an impact to the overall uh, data center uh, network as a result of, of these types of algorithms. Because even if you take an embarrassingly parallel problem like inference, you still have to feed the beast. And if you look at the, the sort of the tops and the, uh, that are coming out of the roadmap on these types of accelerator parts, uh, I, I could imagine being up here and talking about OCP NIC version 5.0 and saying, you know, this is a, needs a terabit or, or more. I mean, it's really incredible how much data it takes, how much data you have to get to the nodes. Uh, and then as the algorithms get better, generally what's happening is there's much more elaborate training networks behind them, and they don't all fit in a single node or even a grouping of nodes. And so these algorithms are processing across the node, and that hits, uh, that hits the data center uh, fabric. Uh, pretty well. So all these changes are really leading to uh, new optimizations uh, in, in the network. Now the other uh, major trend, besides the cloud gets bigger, um, <laughs> which doesn't require a chart, but the other major trend is um, acceleration and offload. And it's really about creating this uh, pervasive intelligence. So I think there's three reasons why we see this happening. One of them is simply agility. And uh, you know, the cloud is very efficient. It's created a lot of competition. And typically, what people do is they find some really cool new service that no one had thought of you know, a quarter before. And then they want to scale it out arbitrarily, which, has, which requires uh, uh, some significant algorithmic work in the infrastructure itself. But we don't want to wait for silicon, develop, uh, silicon development cycles. So we can't have known what those algorithms are in advance, we have to figure out how to make the silicon uh, smarter, more, more, more malleable or fungible. And that's really leading to a lot of the new, new ingredients that we're, we're seeing in the, in the infrastructure space. The other one, uh, or the next one, is infrastructure acceleration. This has been popularized in papers uh, like uh, the data center tax, where people say, hey, you know, the cloud model is about um, creating uh, these uh, efficient uh, clusters of compute and then uh, renting out instances or virtual machines to you know, the broad customer base. And uh, that's the business model. That's how money's made in the, in the infrastructure cloud. Um, and it's great to have a lot of rich infrastructure and do a lot of services and deal with all this data, but it comes at uh, a tax. And so what we want to do is we want to create as much uh, resource as possible in the compute to drive those uh, revenue generating functions that really really lead to business growth. But you can't just offload. Offload actually doesn't work because that's just moving the compute around. You actually have to uh, design new IPs that are really focused at accelerating uh, the infrastructure on specific types of, of tasks. And the last thing that we see is application acceleration itself. And maybe you could argue part of the infrastructure is written at the application layer, and therefore you need some of the same things as an in infrastructure acceleration. But we also see that there's a combination between um, thread, uh, thread parallel workloads where the latency of thread is uh, uh, critical, and data parallel workloads where you really just have to deal with enormous amounts of data. And that's another reason why we see uh, the, these kind of trends in the industry. There's a really uh, interesting new case that I thought was worth just a little bit of an extra double click, and that's this concept of a bare metal server, which is really amusing to me, because what that means is there's no virtualization on the server. If you think about old servers, they used to be bare metal, and then they became virtualized, which is again amusing, because virtualization was invented uh, in, the, in the, you know, the big machine space in the 50s by you know, the people doing the mainframes. Uh, but then the age of virtualization was about applying virtualization to servers. And now the new thing is that people want to be able to rent entire servers, not just virtual instances on the server. 
Um, but that's actually challenging, right? Because what that means is you, you, you're renting it, you're not selling it. So at some point you want to take it back. And to take it back, you need to make sure it's in the same state as when you left it. At a rental car company, they have people who walk around looking for, for dings. I, I was actually rear-ended coming here today. Um, but uh, you can't really do that on a server. You can't really see if someone's changed the software very easily at the lowest level. So they're creating this really uh, fascinating um, uh, infrastructure in which the goal of the infrastructure is to create the illusion to the host that it has a simple NIC and it has a simple disk. And when it writes to the disk, you know, uh, what's going on behind the scenes is there's, there's elaborate infrastructure services where they're making the data available and reliable and replicating it and doing all sorts of really, you know, unique stuff to it. But the host isn't the wiser. So it really, it makes the software on the host uh, more simple and it, and, it, and it disentangles the two functions of running applications and, and really optimizing a scale out infrastructure. So that's a, 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 an interesting trend, and it's, it's leading to um, taking security and storage and networking and even uh, traffic steering or um, some management functions and putting those uh, in the infrastructure. So with all this, what, is, what do we kind of, what does the data center look like you know, today in the cloud? Um, if, you, so if you take an outside looking in approach, uh, and maybe this isn't true at every level of the network, but for multiple levels of the network actually fit within a data center. And what we find is that the, um, the, the physical network um, uh, is just getting larger and larger. And so the problem of making it larger is more of a problem of physics. And so what people want is they want the highest radix and uh, the highest bandwidth. That allows them to have the most capabil bandwidth capability with the fewest number of layers in the network. Power efficiency, or picojoules per bit, is absolutely critical. So people want to be able to send a bit from one point to another with ever um, less energy so that they can send more bits without you know, um, creating a huge power problem. And lastly, reliability is critical. And so what that means is for networking algorithms, for uh, all the routing protocols and everything, we actually want as simple a uh, control plane as possible and still be able to scale. And so people have been taking um, algorithms out of the switches. So the only place that you can actually now create intelligence is by pushing it to the edge of the network. So that's another interesting trend. The, the switch trend also is uh, creating a very interesting trend in optics. Um, and so what we see is that as a combination of the bandwidth reach product, uh, and on the pipes, on the links between the switches. We're going from copper to multi-mode optics to single-mode optics, and then eventually to coherent optics. That's the, the only way to extend the, dist the bandwidth uh, uh, reach or distance product. And what we find is that you know, maybe today the, uh, there will be one layer of pipes that will be single-mode optics, but uh, in the future there'll be more layers. And, you know, ultimately, it may even be the case that inside the, the rack and the chassis themselves, you, you have to use optics because there really is no other way to get all the airflow uh, into and out of the systems and get all the bits up into the network. So when we look at the compute itself, we see that a lot of people are now um, optimizing compute by tiers. And we have uh, a lot of traditional uh, servers, um, as well as... Uh, in some cases, we have SOCs, and there's a number of these types of new platforms in our booth and the booth, uh, other booths here. Um, and now a new thing is that we're actually starting to see sort of uh, accelerator boxes. So now you see these 4U or 6RU boxes with as many accelerator um, uh, types of ingredients in there as, as, as you can. And we're starting to see um, intelligent NICs. So that's the, the sort of the overall trends as we see it. And now what we want to look at is well, two things. One is what do you need to make all this happen? And two, what, uh, what's, what's Intel doing to help? <laughs> uh, so, for, so firstly, so motivating this intelligent NIC or this uh, smart NIC type of uh, infrastructure actually takes a lot of ingredients. Uh, it takes a lot of different types of optimized IPs. So programmable assets like um, uh, CPU cores, but not just, you know, not one type of core, but we have like Xeon cores and Atom cores, for instance, from our company, as well as, as, well as other cores from other folks uh, in the industry. We, we see graphics and media 
acceleration, not just sort of the graphic ch chips that were in our um, laptops, but also transcoding optimized uh, accelerators, crypto acceleration. Uh, we have a, um, a capability called QAT, which we use to try and standardize a lot of the um, crypto functions. And the demand on those complexes is going, is going up and up. Um, flexible state machines. So not everything can be done um, in, um, uh, in, in uh, soft logic. We also, have, we also need to look at how are the state machines designed and can we, through software configuration, increase the efficiency of those state machines or increase the flexibilities of where those state machines can be applied. You know, on the networking side, there's uh, the IEEE IPs, like the Macs and FIs and CERTES, um, but also there are things like RDMA and driving RDMA now. Uh, it, it looks uh, pretty ubiquitous in many environments to use, uh, to use RDMA, both Rocky as well as iWarp and, and new standards, which are, are new, um, uh, new optimizations which are enabled in uh, flexible infrastructure. Uh, but it's not just in the silicon. So the software takes uh, a, major, uh, a major lift. Um, so in the, you know, we, we've done a lot of work on compilers and optimizing to get the, you know, the best um, and most capable ecosystem around uh, uh, operating systems. But we also see that you know, if we're gonna use FPGAs in the environment, we need to have tool chains that allow the bit streams in the FPGAs. There's been a lot of interesting discussion in software-defined networking and announcements and whatnot in uh, P4. P4 is actually a really uh, interesting capability to be able to specify uh, how the data, plane, the data plane of a network. Uh, we can use P4 both to um, um, program these ingredients as well as to represent back up through the host driver layers uh, the intent of of, of the ingredient. So you can use P4 as a spec that tells the OS what, what the hardware is capable of doing to allow optimizations in the, in the software layer. Of course, there's a lot of uh, innovation that needs to go on in the, um, in the media space. So in providing uh, semiconductor media, which allows literally three orders of magnitude less, um, uh, less latency uh, versus um, traditional medias, and then in, even in the, um, the semiconductors itself and the, and the packaging and the, and the way we combine dye together um, uh, on a dye. So all of these, these are all the types of assets we need to really drive this new infrastructure. A lot of these, a lot of these innovations uh, and investments are really done to make the infrastructure intelligent. So that's, that's the, the sort of the foundational shift which is going on right now in the say in the, in the ingredient space. So what have we done? I mean, it's fun to call this stuff out, but I wanted to uh, give you a couple of concrete examples of things we're doing here in the show. So this is a OCP uh, NIC card, uh, ver and I think this is a lot more than the NIC, but version 3.0. We've been participating in OCP uh, 1.0, 2.0. We did a lot of work on 2.0, um, and now 3.0. This is this small card actually can consume 100 or can enable 150 watts of TDP. Not that we brag about burning a lot of power, but creating uh, a capability where you can direct power is really important for enabling uh, intelligent infrastructure. And up to 32 lanes of PCIe in this card, um, both in and now capable to do the Gen 4 uh, and the Gen 5. So we've uh, we're really happy about this um, and. Um, in uh, OCP in general, um, you know, it's pretty fascinating uh, how this has grown up. So we've been, again, participating in OCP since the beginning. We actually have 25 uh, different SKUs of both um, NICs as well as PHI chips. Because again, because of the physics, sometimes we have to add PHI chips on OCP cards. Um, and in, we, we're proud that we've, we've shipped in our branded environments over a million ports into OCP. This is not to any one customer or any two customers. This is actually into a whole, a whole ecosystem. Now we have partners who aren't uh, driving the Intel brand who've shipped, uh, shipped even more. So and we, we're also happy that we've, we've shipped like 1.3 billion 
ports in the 35-year history of the networking division at, at Intel. But you know, a, a million units already shipped in a new innovative uh, cloud environment, I think is a real demonstration that uh, we're beyond the emergence of an ecosystem. And people are actually looking forward uh, to uh, looking at OCP as really the place, uh, the place to go, go drive this stuff. Uh, we're very excited about this in the future as we go beyond 40 gig. And we're just, we think that um, uh, OCP NICs are, 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 are just are really, really great. Now, we're not just a NIC uh, company. So also in our group, we do silicon photonics, which is a pretty new business unit. We, I think we announced our first uh, production of our first silicon photonics uh, just a couple of years ago. And uh, we're really happy to say that we were able to take uh, CWDM, now that stands for, so I'm just gonna say TLAs, coarse wavelength division multiplexing, where you, you, the wavelengths are coarse. So they weren't designed in a telecom environment where you have to put a lot of uh, technology into cooling the optics. They're, the the, the um, lasers are, the, uh, are done on a 20 nanometer grid spacing. Uh, but we want to do duplex fiber, which is less expensive than parallel fiber because there's fewer fibers. Um, so we did the CWDM4, uh, and we've, uh, we've been in production with that. We did an OCP variant to that because we also we wanted to make it uh, you know, even more consumable by the market. So we wanted to say, hey, this is really good even for 500 meters and lower. And this is really good for, um, you know, if we, if we control the temperature range a bit, uh, we can make it less expensive and really drive even higher volume. So we're really happy to say that our, um, our OCP version is in mass production. Uh, it's a really exciting uh, product. And, and, uh, and I believe that um, you know, optics is really, is, is really changing a lot, and OCP is helping to change the optical industry. Those data center, the big cloud scale out data centers, uh, we need optics to keep uh, driving them forward. Um, and more on semiconductor economics than, than classical, classical optics. The other thing that we, we are happy to talk about, and this is, uh, I have a, a sample of this. This is our, our 400 gig CWDM8 module. Now because the, the data keeps growing, <laughs> we need the optics to get faster. So this is a 400 gig. The 400 gig is coming out in the industry um, uh, this year. And um, you know we wanted to double the number of bits which are sent over each wavelength. And we wanted to double the number of wavelengths. So still a 20 nanometer spacing, we now have eight lasers we've been able to integrate onto a, um, onto a QSS uh, DD module. Uh, and we have, uh, we have it working in the lab. So we have, this is a technology demonstration. So this first picture on the top, that's the optical interface. What we've done with um, CWDM8 as a, a means of innovation uh, to make the optics simpler and more readily available to the, to the industry is to stick with the NRZ encoding, which makes the optics about the link budget about 60 B easier to accomplish. And, um, but the, the electrical specifications for 400 gig as defined by the IEEE, so it's called Kadawi 8, it's really eight lanes of PAM4. And you can see in this chart the PAM4i uh, on the host side, the electrical side uh, in our lab here, that's got the four, the four levels, which is the distinctive PAM characteristic. Also very challenging to engineer, but we're really excited about being able to, to, to bring this new technology uh, out into the market and just get to that next level of scale in the, in, in the data center. And again, we think that the OCP environment is a great uh, ecosystem to work with people to really drive, to drive these uh, new technologies. Um, in particular, uh, and I think we've heard other people in, in this forum and you know, in, in, in recent industry events talk about just the speed at which we need to drive to new standards to really bring the whole industry along and the need for MSAs and, and close-knit groups where people in the industry are just working together to, to, to drive it faster. So we, we believe that um, there's a great future uh, for optics here in this, uh, this community. Thank you, that wraps up my talk, but I do have five minutes left and be happy to take your questions unless you wanna go get cocktails or something.
Hi, Ori. Uh, Dan Pitt, MEF. Um, I'm just curious about what Intel thinks of the stuff that's going on in programmable switching chip technology, like you see out here and you hear from yeah. others that have announced. Yeah, so the, I mean, I think on, on one level we have to make sure that we can drive the, uh, the bandwidths forward and we have to be really careful about um, just the re reliability and ringing out the technology. But we also know that we need programmability and we need programmability not just at the endpoint, we also need it uh, in the switches because you know, I think like the, the, if you think of the switches or the ports as the highways, you know, there's on-ramps and off-ramps. And you might leave your home and be able to do a lot of planning, but if you can't control what ports you're going on, you can't get to where you want, right? So I, I think um, SDN in general, I know we've done a lot of work on SDN is great. Um, I think it's been a little bit hard uh, in the early days to really get stuff that worked because of the level of abstraction. Uh, what I, I, I like about P4 and some of the other SDN initiatives out there is it, it feels like the industry is really getting better at, um, at defining uh, a programmable uh, infrastructure, including, including the switch data plans. And feel free if anyone has a question to just ask me and I'll repeat it. I, I know there must be some really good, really good questions. <laughs> All right, Yuri, so you, uh, you talked about uh, workloads uh, and the evolving workloads. Uh, what would you say is one of the most important ones that you see on the horizon? What do you think was gonna, the effects on network, what, it, what would you say, if you had to pick one, what would it be? Well, I, I think, um, I, th I think sometimes we get excited about the dizzying graphs around artificial intelligence. I don't want to um, downplay that, but um, there's a conventional workload, which I think is undergoing a lot of change, and that's storage, right? And um, again, you, you have to move the data, uh, and you have to get into the data and, and comprehend and search the data and, make, and derive intelligent results from it. Uh, so you have to store it someplace. And, um, to really take advantage of all the silicon and the distributed nature, we have to do it fast. Um, classically, uh, we were sitting behind media that has a spin time, you know, and so you would write, um, you do like a lot of caching code that would take, maybe you could take milliseconds in that caching code. And we don't have that anymore. Now we have um, a media that can respond in sub 100 microseconds, in some cases, even sub 10 microseconds. So that's an area of really significant innovation, and we really have to, and it's hard. I mean, this is all my storage friends tell me it's hard. I don't really understand it that well, but you know, it's, it's hard to get storage right. There's a lot of different format conversions, and so that's, that's an area we'd like to see a lot, more, a lot more work in. Okay, well, it is probably close to six o'clock, and thank you very much for, for um, joining this presentation. Uh, and if, if anyone uh, has any further questions, feel free to just reach out and, and we'll be happy to answer them. Right, thank you.